This is a trigger warning, just letting you know that in this episode, we will briefly discuss family abuse. They're all going to laugh at you. They're all going to laugh at you. They're all going to laugh at you. I'm Steph. And I'm Ange. We're Nerdazons. <laughs> we put so much effort into our intros. I hope everyone How was likes it? them. I liked it. It was really okay. good. Okay, good. This fortnight is bringing you into October. So Halloween. Ooh, so exciting. So, I know, your favourite time of the year. I know. So I thought, why not me, of all people, choose a horror film? I've chosen Kerry from 1976 and Kerry in 2013. So first of all, the synopsis. 1976 says, Kerry White, a shy, friendless teenage girl who was sheltered by her domineering religious mother, unleashes her telekinetic powers after being humiliated by her classmates at her senior prom. 2013 says, a shy girl outcasted by her peers and sheltered by her religious mother, unleashes telekinetic kinetic terror on her own small town after being pushed too far at the senior prom. I had seen the 1976 quite a few times because I watched Grease and I was like, oh, John Travolta. <laughs> and then, so that's why I kind of watched Carrie and everybody's like, it's not super scary. It's not yeah. anything like that. And I was like, uh, maybe. So then I watched it and I was like, this isn't too bad. Yeah. I had only watched the original probably once. What scene stood out to me was the end and it was, I, I had forgotten all the beginning part really, to be honest. So um, I watched it as a kid. Um <laughs> And so that's why I don't remember much. And it's so iconic now, that scene. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, we could break it down to the cast. Oh, my God, yes. This is the part I'm waiting the most to talk about. So (laughs) Cece Spacek was... 100% the best. Amazing. She was so good in that role. She plays crazy well. Oh, right. I think Chloe Grace Mortez playing Kerry, she was... She's very young looking to begin with, but she had such an innocent, fluffy kind of-ness to her where it yeah. wasn't believable that she was going crazy. I don't know. I just yeah. feel like that. No, no, no. You're, you're on. It, it's exactly what I was thinking. So Sissy Spacex, uh, when she acted, you really did believe, like, for example, the shower scene, like it it truly came across that she didn't understand what was happening to her or like you could see she was a girl, like her little head twitches when people would talk to her and she'd look away and she'd just shake her head and walk off and she really didn't seem all there or seem like someone who was who had been socialised with other people her age, yes. whereas Chloe, great actress, I really, really love her in most of the things mm-hmm. she does, but this one I feel was a bit of a hit and a miss because as soon as you look at her, she doesn't come across like the girl who has been homeschooled her whole life. She looks like the girl that's friendly. Even when she socialised with other people, she came across like she was okay with that, whereas Sissy Spacek was still sort of on edge. Yes. I just think it was uh, uh, just a nut for the for, for Chloe. I was thinking to myself, I wonder who would be a really good Carrie. And I thought, Lindsay Lohan. And then I looked and I actually found out that she was considered for the role. Yeah. But that's I, when I she went that. a bit cuckoo. And so that's why they didn't go with her. I don't, I, I actually don't think she would have done well. Like she's always had, like in Lindsay Lohan roles, she's always been, her personality has been quite dominant and fiery, but I don't think she could accomplish the beginning part of Carrie mm-hmm. until she breaks out of her shell once yes. she's like snapped essentially. I think she could do the end part, but I, I feel she couldn't pull off the beginning part. But I just think Sissy Spacek, she did it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Chef's I kiss, agree. you know, what? like mm-hmm. she had that perfect. Even when she was at home and the way she interacted with her mum, it was 
like believable that she was scared. I feel Chloe's default in in her acting was to drop her head and just sort of like just look away sort of thing, but it didn't have any of the other actions. Like she didn't have the sharp jerk or the scared tone in her voice and the rushed like breathing that she's afraid that something's going to happen. Like no, 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 no sort of thing. That just didn't come across in Chloe's acting, I feel, compared to Sissy Spacek. Speaking of that, so why not move on to the mother, Margaret? Piper, Laurie as Margaret White, and then as Julian Moore. Oh, I think they were both great. <gasps> okay, yeah, good. I was going to say the same. I actually think in their own ways, Julian Moore was freaky in the sense of like, oh, my God, like body mutilation freaky. She's a freak. And she went like over the top. Yeah. And I just felt like she was great. Absolutely. The way that she interacted with her daughter, you were just like, oh, I'm scared of you. And which is all we have to do is pray and come and burn the books. And I was just like, you're so scary. Uh-uh. Yeah. But I feel um, in her character, she was great in it. I, I think they both were. But I feel what lacked in Julianne Moore's character compared to Piper Laurie is in, as soon as you meet Piper Laurie as soon as she comes in the house like it's an immediate abuse towards Carrie it, she had no fault of her own of what had happened at the school in fact it was the mother's fault for not educating, educating. her daughter mm. yeah and so like immediate abuse even the way she rips her hair and shoves her in the closet that looked so believable I actually feel she was pulling her by the hair and dragging her in the closet. Mm-hmm. You didn't really see much of that with Julianne more. So Chloe, I feel she more mentally abused her than yep. the physical abuse. And the physical abuse was to her doing it to her own, her own body. And it was just a different dynamic. What do you think of the different beginning? Seeing the remake where they're actually showing the, the childbirth and she's just like, should I kill this baby? Wait, you mean, oh, yes, yeah, on the bed with Julianne yep. more on the bed? Yeah, I don't think it was really needed, to be honest. I thought that the story of the mum, I thought it was portrayed really well in the original when she can see that Carrie's starting to snap and and when Carrie shows that she's got her telekinesis power and she's, like, eyeing her off before she goes to prom and she's like, you know what, this is what happened to me and I know you're the, like, evil child that came from that evil deed. And, like, mm-hmm. you, it was just so vindictive and poisonous to come out of her tongue that it was all that was necessary to be said, I didn't really need to see her go through her the birth in her bed in this yeah. like old house and no one would be like that. I'm sure That's, if you're a single mum, you would have been at a hospital at that day and age. No, see, I don't think so because she wouldn't believe in going to hospitals because science. So she, I just feel like yeah. that. I I liked it in the fact that it just added that extra creepiness the to me the oh just ickiness what did you think about the chemistry between Carrie and her mum in both again I feel like there was a different dynamic between them in in the original you can see it was a clear fear that Sissy had and in the second one you can you could feel the love that came through Chloe like she loved her mum but she just needed her to let her grow I kind of think the fear is what adds to the story of the original Mm -hmm. it's a story about a girl who's traumatized probably the only story and the only time you're happy that the villain is the one that kills everyone (laughs) like it's deserved I don't know I, I think it was a bit the chemistry if we talk about the chemistry itself in the second one I feel it no, it didn't spark with me like I can see that Chloe was the one who was overly attentive to her mom and she's like oh but this is what it is and it's really good and the way she acted came across very lovingly it just didn't vibe and it didn't come across it was more believable like, in the original for me that she definitely had like you said that fear and that it was completely toxic and just heartbreaking whereas the new one they were kind of nice to each other in some yeah. respects and I'm just like but no yeah that's what I like I think that's what makes the end scene so powerful in the original because it's it's and I think you know some people I'm not saying everyone but it does happen in some households you know you you could be suffering from like abuse be it mental or physical but you'll still always have that connection with your parents and then the fact that the whole way through she sees nothing but torment from her mum but then when she kills her mum she is absolutely gutted and it's just so conflicting and I feel that it's a powerful a powerful message that come across whereas in the second one Chloe's like showing love to her mom, but she also shows like 
determination and like I'm gonna be my own person mm-hmm. then Julianne Moore's like mean but not fully mean but then she shows like oh but you know I loved you that's why I couldn't kill you and then she's gonna kill you and it just it, it kept contradicting it each other. It. What I'm really interested in is what you think of Betty Buckley as Miss Collins versus Judy Greer as Mrs. DeJardin, the teachers. So first off the bat, I love Judy Greer. She's an archer. Yeah, she's um, amazing. I just love her. She's in so much. She's also in the newer Halloween films as Jamie Lee Curtis's daughter. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's how I think they got Jamie Lee Curtis on in last year's season of Archer she was in one episode oh, uh, she really? did a voice yeah because she worked with Judy Greer and she's like oh I do this and I'm like oh, I love Archer that's <laughs> awesome yeah it's 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 interesting I actually feel this is this is a character that almost doesn't sort of age well it ages well but it doesn't I, I don't know if age as well is the right thing I think this is a character that you can clearly see a difference in the generation. So from the 70s to the new millennium, like 2013. So the the original, she was tough. And I can't believe, first of all, she, slapped she got away with slapping the... Both of them. She slapped Sissy even in the shower to shut her up. Oh, that's right. It wasn't... Oh, my gosh. It wasn't just Chris that they... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, like... Oh, that's right, when she was, like, shut up and... Stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I don't know. I, okay, I feel that the original had that very protective feel, but a very strong protective feel, like, yeah. don't mess with me. I think yeah. Judy lacked that, you know, don't mess with me vibe from, like, anyone else, mm-hmm. whereas I feel the students could kind of mess with her a little bit because she, she is, you know, tiny, she's got a cute little voice, and whereas the other one, she had a firm, authoritative voice. That yeah. It's a big difference, but I, I can see they tried to tone it down a little bit in the 2013 because, of course, she's absolutely right. It was child abuse what she did, and she'd be in trouble if a teacher did that today. I know, I know. Uh, what did I... you think of them? I like Judy Greer as well. I thought she was like great. I was like, oh my god, you're from Suddenly Thirty. Yes, oh, I yes. love that movie. Yeah, I like her and other stuff as well. But I would have actually been scared of Miss Collins. Same. Um, but when she was when she was talking to Kerry, going, "Are you sure you want to go on pr- to prom with this boy?" Like, I she's like, "Yeah, no, I think I will." And she's I like the fact that she was protective of her but caring enough but like being I don't know how to explain it she had a very eternal yes like it instantly switched when she was with Carrie and I liked that about the character itself and that's what I liked that about Judy and Betty but it was it was more obvious to see the difference between the two like you had the stern almost matron and then you had the really maternal figure, which she didn't have in her life. And and I feel you could see she was protective of her for that. And it was it came across well. Whereas mm-hmm. with Judy, it came across almost like preppy, just like I want to be everybody's friend. Yeah. I'm the yeah. cool teacher. I agree. I, I definitely agree. I also want to talk about Sue Snell and Tommy Ross and and those those ones all together. Oh my god. Okay, yeah, I have a lot to say on this topic. <laughs> so, first of all, I don't like that Gabriella Wilde is Sue Snell. They made it almost look like America's Next Top Model. Do you know what I mean? Like I didn't like that at all. But in saying that it is it is it is what the the popular girls are all like now I think even and you can see the clear difference even from the 90s to now Mm -hmm. in in all the films that we watch now that's how they dress that's how they act that's they've you know got every makeup product under the sun they look older than what they are that's it but I kind of liked the original you know the main popular girl who was the one who was trying to redeem herself you know she had the curly hair she didn't really have the makeup on and I liked that about her yes like it was natural Yes. I sound like an old lady now. No. <laughs> me about the younger generation. Oh, back in my day. I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't like Ansel Elgort as Tommy Ross. I'm not a big fan of him. Whereas William Cat, whoa, like, 
I would have gone to prom with him, with his beautiful, beautiful blonde mullet. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I, I, it was a very different vibe between the two. Based on looks, neither of them really do it for me, so I don't really care. <laughs> so, <laughs> But based on attitude, I feel like if his girlfriend didn't ask him to do it in the original, he would have bullied her just as much as everyone else. Whereas I actually yeah. feel in the remake, he had a genuine sincerity to her and to be yeah. nice to her. And it, it, the whole prom situation came across like he was her friend and it wasn't like yeah. a date. They were there as friends and he was just trying yeah. to help her. Whereas in the other one, I, I feel he also kind of led her on a little bit. Like oh, he yeah, kissed her on the great. dance floor. And I'm like, he dude, was... you, you got a girlfriend, man. <laughs> what are you doing? Pat was an asshole, And... I just feel like even if, you know, if I was in Kerry's shoes, I'd just be like, no, like, yeah, I'd be super sus if, you know. Me too. I'd be on yeah. constant alert thinking, oh, and what's going to happen? Whereas, you know, Ansel Elgort asking a prom, it kind of felt like, yeah, I'll take you to prom. Like, we're, we're mates, you know. What are your thoughts on both of them dying by the bucket on the head? Like... <laughs> well, so in the original, I don't think he died because everyone, when she shut the doors, everyone was carrying him out. I think he was just unconscious. And then I, th I think it was the same in the second one because everyone left him there on the stage and he just burnt in the fire. Yeah, I know. But, like, how can a bucket in the head kill you or but knock a bucket, you out? Especially since it's an empty bucket. But I think gravity and it's a metal bucket. I guess. But I thought it was absolutely hilarious. I know. Well, I mean, on if you're going to talk about that, how funny was it when the girl got hit with the water and then just fell back onto the table in the original? It's like, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> going into the – no, actually, we'll leave that. We'll leave it for the um, plot. And I just wanted to say that I really like John Travolta and I, I think – he was great and he was played a sleazebag so well. Oh, man, I was not expecting that character. I think because I only ever really remembered the end scene. I'd forgotten he was even in it until you said he was in it and I was just like, whoa, I was not expecting him. He would be a horrible person to be dating. Um, even when he, like, you could kind of see it was a little tap. He really probably didn't even want to do it when they're in the car and the first time he taps her on the face, like, don't call me that. And I was just, I was just like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, he came across way worse mm -hmm. than the remake. And I think he, he definitely wins that point for sure. Yeah. But I do actually want to mention one thing about her in the second one that I, I found quite disturbing. She was psychotic. Like, I get it if you don't like someone and you just want to get back at them. And and in the, in the original, you know, she was all huffy puffy. But in the remake, she really came across psychotic. I really didn't need to see this scene either and I dislike it. But when they go to kill the pigs, they, like, kind of extended it a little bit in the remake. And then they just show how, like, crazy she is going to kill yes. and slit the throat. And it's like, I, I don't need to see that. I just need nah. you to uh, allude to the fact that you killed the pig. But I don't need to see it. And but the fact that she just, like, jumped straight in there I'm like you're a psycho and then she was like all for them killing her it's like she didn't even think of the consequences yeah it was I just agree. pure hatred and and it was just kind of disturbing compared to the original you know I know in the original she wanted him to to drive him down too but she just didn't look that crazy like mm -hmm. and determined to viciously hurt someone I yes I agree but I also think that friend was I just feel like you know, her, her best friend who tried to save the day. Um, first of all, you got the names wrong. I was talking about Sue Snell, which is the friend who tried to save. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And yep. now, and so that's who I was talking about, which I can just. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was talking about the bad. Chris. Yes, yeah, the bad. I was talking about Chris. And so anyway, going back to Sue, the best friend. Yeah. I felt that in the new one, she why did you all of a sudden want to be best friends with Carrie? I don't know. I actually think and both of them in the in the original and in the second one, it was – you could see instant regret on their faces in the shower scene. I think they really – that was a really good camera shot in both of them for them to do uh, and focus on them at the back of the crowd while everyone's throwing everything because it, it shows the instant regret of what they're doing – and you can see that they feel guilty about it. And I, I do like that Chris calls Sue out in yeah. the, the prom room and she's like, oh, you're, you're just doing it because, you you know, you want to get your points to be like the prom 
queen and I like that she made the point not to go mm-hmm. um, because it just it made that act made it seem a bit more genuine um, mm-hmm. but in the original it definitely came across more sincere that she was trying to repent for what she had done I didn't like that at all in the in the 2013 one I but also I didn't like her in the original as well because I felt like she was completely fake toward towards Kerry. And when she was uh, getting her boyfriend to ask Kerry to the prom, in the original I thought, why are you trying to get her to go to the prom? Like, why? Like, you're I was the same. I was you're so ske- sceptical, yeah. Whereas in the remake it's actually like, hey, they actually are looking out for Kerry. They want her to have a good time. Yeah. They're mates. I think, though, um, now that you, you know, you make a really, really good point, but I think what they could, what she should have done in the first place is go and talk to Carrie herself. She didn't once go up to Carrie and apologize. She made her boyfriend do something he didn't want to do just to make her feel better for what they did to her. And I think if, 100% right, I was even skeptical. And I liked that the teacher knew straight away and she called them out on it. It's like, Mm -hmm. what are you doing? But, yeah, you make a really good point. Apart from the camera shot to sort of represent that she was feeling bad about what was happening, she didn't really, as a person and as a character, do anything Mm-mm. to, like, fix it. If anything, she made it worse. Okay, so do you want to move on to the storyline now? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, sorry, we went deep into the characters this, this episode. I think it was good. It needed to be done, actually. Yeah. So the first point I want to say, because I'll mm-hmm. probably forget it otherwise – and I mentioned it earlier. First one I want to ask is, what are your thoughts on the storyline of the teacher and how it ended for her? I don't know how I feel about that. I Can I just say, the camera shot in the remake, when especially, I just need to get tell, talk, tell about this, especially when Kerry does go psycho and that you see, like, everybody's faces just like distort and when Kerry's running away and she gets in the car with Sue and then you know she flips the car and you see Sue's face just like <gasps> that was good I thought I was that like, was that's, really good that's really good so I was kind of sad that the teacher died like mm-hmm. she got she got chopped yeah yeah she did she did I like that the, the teacher you know saved Kerry from being electrocuted and and stuff but I don't know I like that it was just a clean everybody kind of died I think they were both storylines worked well for the time it came out and I like that she just snapped and she got rid of everyone you know like it was just it was the perfect definition of seeing red like even if it's her friend she just saw red and she was just like and you pushed her like really far although in saying in the second one I think that is 100% so much worse what they did to her because obviously the storyline had changed to suit the newer generation. Oh my goodness. When they recorded her and put it up online and then they played that at the, you know, the end of year farewell. I just think oh, that, that was, was so, that was just the nastiest thing to do on top of that. And I just, I could see why she snapped and I'm like, yeah, you, you kill them. I you deserve agree. it. But it's also interesting because I had, I had a, an American teacher for years in high school for quite a few years in different classes and she she always made the point to like say you probably shouldn't say this but she always made the point to say in schools in America you always make friends with the sad Mm -hmm. loner kids because if they ever did snap and like a Columbine situation Mm -hmm. happened or something you might be protected because you were friends with them and I feel like this portrayed that really well it's not it's not a happy topic to talk about but I think it's a very obvious thing that you know she showed that this is the one person that did actually show me nice feelings everyone else in the film pretty much died it was a pretty good movie like in all honesty I liked both yeah for the storyline I think this is actually a really good storyline that they did well to fit in a new generation and to like mix the new all the new modern Mm-hmm. technology and um, norms in society and things like that. And I think they did that really well. A few things like the actors, the choice of actors and actresses that they got that didn't quite bring across the characters. So what did you think of the final scene of I... the actual blood? <laughs> oh, uh, As I mentioned, I think that was so much worse than the second one. I wasn't expecting them to play the video and I was just like, that I is kind so of was. mean. I wasn't expecting because, it. Because they were plotting and I was just like, nah, they're going to, something's going to go wrong. You know, they're going to just 
pull that as well as do something else. Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't expecting it for once I was caught off guard and I, I was just like, that is so nasty. I actually think both end scenes were done well. And to be honest, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed Carrie's revenge in the end, uh, like at the end of the second one. I enjoyed her literally killing every single one that was so nasty to her. Like mm-hmm. all the girls that were snickering and bickering. And it's like, just to see her get her revenge. I'm like, you know what? I am supportive of the villain in this one. Yep. <laughs> like you deserve your revenge. I do think though, the end scene in the house with her mom was done better in the original. Oh, the actual house. Yeah. When she, yep. when her mom kills her, like it just, there was so much more of the extreme emotions between them. Like the mom was like, Crazy, really crazy. And you could see Sissy Spacek was so tormented and conflicted on what to do. And they, it's like they had heightened those emotions between them. Yeah. And it, the scene came out really well. Whereas even when Chloe was saying, you know, no, like, what are you doing? It didn't seem like she was really, truly begging for her life. <laughs> I know that's horrible to say. but No, but I agree. And also the knife part where, you know, the knives are... I thought, you know, it was... It was done really well for the 1976 one. Yeah, I just it was, a few knives is all it just needed. A few knives is all it took. It didn't need to take an entire cutlery draw. I agree. The and then I don't know. I just thought that was a little bit over the top. I I 100% agree. And I, I feel you kind of lost the symbolism of the way her mum was pinned to the wall in the original. It was just the few key points that made her look like Jesus when she was dead, you know, mm-hmm. which it, it's just, yeah. In the second one, it was so, yeah, over the, over the top. Um, I didn't like that the girl came in the house, though. Susie? So, yeah, I didn't think it was needed. You know, I actually thought her not seeing her at the end tormented her more mentally, whereas in that one she just said, just leave me alone. And I feel she kind of would have got a little bit of closure because she went there, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like she she even said, you, you know, you're pregnant, you should be leaving now, I'm bringing the house down sort of thing. Yeah. So how can you think, oh, yeah, she really hates me. Why would she save you then? Like I, I just think she shouldn't have been there. One thing that I do also want to mention about the, the storyline, they developed Carrie's character a little bit more. I, I feel like I can see why they did it, but it, it didn't it didn't really work, and so I don't see why they did it. When Carrie was in the office and they were saying, oh, you know, you, you're not allowed to be homeschooled anymore. So it, they t- tried to sh- show, yes, she was a homeschooled child. That's why she doesn't fit in. But it didn't really work well, you know what I mean? Whereas in the original, she already looked like she didn't socialise with other people. And that's why she was a bit awkward. But and this also one, when the principal kept calling her the different name, oh, she understand. was just like, eh, at the second one. Whereas the first one, she's like, my name's Carrie. Not yeah. Karen, it's Carrie. She was a bit more defensive about that, whereas, like I said at the beginning, I feel like the 2013 Carrie was a lot fluffier and a lot. She didn't have the angst. She no, didn't have she didn't, the... That's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's a good word to describe it, angst. She didn't have, oh, F you up. Yeah, I, and I don't know, like, she just, I don't know if she, because she's never ex- maybe experienced it as an actress, or but she didn't look like someone who's been bullied, no. like, and tormented. She was whereas, pretty. Yeah, and Sissy came across that she, you could tell she was being bullied in school and out of school. Like, you could just tell it was constant torment for her, and she she just acted that brilliantly. Definitely Sissy wins. Mwah. I agree. How many movie reels do you give 1976? Do you know what? Every time I do this, I always try to make myself prepare, but I'm not prepared. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a classic. I think, you know, you could watch it again. I, again, I wouldn't say it's my like top of the favorite horror film, so I'd I'd probably go a three point seven five in my opinion. It can be a bit slow until you get to the end, and I can understand why people would prefer the newer mm-hmm. the newer one. It just added little bits to you know the telekinesis and things like that, so it it'll, it would keep people a bit more engaged. See, so yeah, I'd probably go three point seven five. I like the film. I'd watch it again. I don't hate it. I probably wouldn't go out of my way to also put it on. I'm going to go with 3.5 because it's not my favourite movie of all time. It was a great movie. I don't think it a must-see movie. I don't think it's a, you know, world's greatest movie of all time. It wasn't as scary as what I was expecting it to be, especially when I did watch it the first time. I remember thinking it's not 
that scary. Mm. So, you know, being a horror film, I was thinking, oh, it's going to, you know. Yeah, that's when giving it 3.5. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm babbling too much this episode. No, no, I agree. And I just think if you, if you want to watch a film where, you know, the villain wins, watch this. Because you don't get to see it often, and, and it was so sweet to see her revenge at the end. What about the 2013? I, I don't think it's a bad remake, and I think they had things that worked really well for it. I'd probably give this one a three. You know, my I'm a bit biased. I would prefer to most of the time go and watch the original. Yeah, I don't think it was bad. I think a three. I think if it's on, I'd watch it. Again, I wouldn't go out of my way. Carrie's storyline is not, you know, gripping enough for me to go and warrant to put it on, but... I think a three. I was going to go the same. I'm going to go with three for the same reason. It was whatever. (laughs) Um, Because, I mean, I loved the scenes at the end when she was going through the car. I loved when they got pushed and, you know, you saw all that. And his nose smash and uh, like in the steering wheel. I love yeah. I think that was also a sweet satisfaction revenge because – Chris saw she had to watch in slow like motion almost that yeah Carrie's the one that killed you after everything you did because in the original she didn't really see it Carrie just turns and then bang the car goes so it was just it was good to see that I I agree it's done well I do like that car scene a lot better yeah definitely so what do you think the 1976 got on Rotten Tomatoes okay it's a classic I know Classics usually get rated quite high, mm-hmm. but I think I'm going to go sort of similar to how we perceived it. It's, it's, you know, it's great, but it's not mm-hmm. at the top. So I'm going to go 78. Higher. Um, oh, I'm very high. higher. Oh, okay. 89. Close, but higher. It got <gasps> um 93%. Wow. The audience score gave it 77% though. Oh, I was close to the audience score. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can I can see why it got that. I, I feel like a lot of classics and it was a clean it was a clean cut film. Like if you looked mm-hmm. at what worked well and everything worked well, that film did it right. Yeah. What so do, what do you think two thousand and thirteen got? I actually personally think it should be like an average score in my opinion, not like a low score. I actually think it should be a fairly high average score, but yep. I feel like Fans of the film are gonna what is what's gonna drag it down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry, so, I'm look, I'm looking at you going. <laughs> how are you gonna go? Mm, you're on the right track. <laughs> no, you're not. Yes, you are. Yeah, <laughs> I like to break down why I think of how I'm gonna rate it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna give this one a 67. Close but lower. <gasps> really? That's kind. Of, it's kind of disappointing because I think the film's not that bad. Um, and I think it should have been around the 70% mark. But, all right, let's give it another go. Am I, like, way off lower? Clo- uh, ish. 62. Lower. It got, you were correct in the beginning in giving it an average score because it got an average score of 50%. Wow, I, I think it actually. Forty-four. Oh, I think it deserves a little bit more than that. I don't think it was a terrible remake, and we've seen some pretty bad remakes. Like I actually think this is one of the better remakes, and they tried. They they actually got some themes done well for the newer audience, and I think mm-hmm. it worked. So I personally don't except, think except except Carrie herself. I just yes. don't think she did a very good job. I think if they. Yeah. Didn't she somebody who was so pretty and so I agree. Americanly stereotypically pretty? Yes, yes. I I don't like using this term, but as no. my godmother who introduced me to this film, she used to say Sissy Spacek was a plain Jane. Yes. And that's why it worked. And I think yes. if they found someone, yeah, that wasn't already a Hollywood beauty, yeah. it would have done better. Yep. But I don't Even having think... like a no name would have been great. I agree. But not yeah. like a model looking no name, you know. Yep. Like your average high school girl. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to Nerdisons Nerdy Notables. Okay. So I have to say, I watched The Moth Effect. <gasps> did you? Did you? I didn't. I, I'm not up to McDonough's episode yet. I'm only three episodes in. Oh. But- I love it. And it was really funny because I was scrolling because mum and I are watching Nine Perfect Strangers. Yeah, so good. 
the, the new Lace episode we're watching tonight. Have you read the um, book? I didn't even know it was a book. Because everyone um, is a sidestep. Everyone at work is talking about this new series and people are like, oh, yeah, I've read the book. And I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't even know it was a book. <laughs> so, I shall add that to my list. Yeah. Um, so we were watching we we're watching Nine Perfect Strangers and then the Moth Effect came up and there was a David Wenham episode. So mum's like, oh, we so have good. to watch this show. It's got David Wenham. And that was such a good episode with that the pillow. Was, that was so good. I thought that was <laughs> amazing. Yeah. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but please watch the Moth Effect. Yes. It is so funny. Okay, so... One other thing is that I was going on Kindle and uh, my mate is actually an editor for, for some authors and she, I get some books through her. So, and they're always trashy um, mm -hmm. romances. And then it came up a suggestion for me and I thought, mm, what is this? So it is called Kissing the Coronavirus cost me 99 cents and it's um, only 16 pages long and the story behind it is when COVID first hit this lady decided to just write a story about uh, COVID. The bit you and told me about yesterday worth that 99 so, cents and so, I just yeah. need you to read it and let everyone else hear it because this so, is perfect. So yeah it's basically just supporting a, a lady who lost her job during COVID so I just thought I would read the first little paragraph kissing the coronavirus she was supposed to cure the coronavirus instead she fell in love with it dr alexa ashingtonford stared at the test tube between her fingers her perfectly pink manicured nails clashing with the pale bubbling liquid inside she recognized the power in her grip the virus which had claimed so many lives and which made her heart beat furiously like a wild tiger thrashing in its cage the coronavirus dot 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 so that is written by mj edwards and i highly recommend if you do want to have a bit of a giggle seriously i need to buy that book can you send me the link because i think it's worth the dollar it just sounds yeah. amazing and i think this author deserves to get some income from this incredibly <laughs> funny book yeah it'll surprise you at the end <laughs> yes yes so, yeah, there's pretty much not much new with me, but I did prepare a Penny Dreadful. So yes. for those of you that listen to our season one, which is incredibly different to what we do now. Um, Agreed. And we applaud you for getting through our season one. We're not the biggest fans of it, but we learnt from our first season to be able to we bring did. you what we have. But Steph used to do Steph's Fun Facts and I used to do Angela's Penny Dreadfuls. And because it's Halloween, I'm going to do a Penny Dreadful for both of our episodes. So this Penny Dreadful is actually Steph's choice. Steph wanted to do a Penny Dreadful on Elizabeth Bathory. So if no I one knows... I did! I didn't realise that you, that you remembered. Yeah, you were talking. You were, like, obsessed with her. I feel like you went down the YouTube rabbit hole or something because... I did. You... Yeah. <laughs> I did. And then I was like, oh, I just want to know about her. And she thinks she's creepy. And then I didn't realize you're going to tell everyone. That's exciting. Yeah. See, I actually knew about her years ago. So remember when I told you, like, way back in primary school, I was obsessed with vampires. It, like, <laughs> obsessed with them. And um, Elizabeth Bathory was in a lot of, um, like, Dracula movies where they'll mention her or um, – I had a game called Atmosphere. Do you remember that with the VHS? And you had, like, the no. Game Master. Oh, it's so cool. So you had, like, five characters. You had the vampire, Elizabeth Bathory. You had the zombie, so Baron Samedi. You had the werewolf. Anyway, you had all those characters. So I knew about her anyway. Um, but I think it's pretty cool to be able to do it this time. Yes. So take it away. Take it away. It's so nerve-wracking. I haven't done one in so long. <laughs> so... Countess Elizabeth Bathory de Exed was born 7th of August 1560 and she died 21 August 1614. She was a Hungarian noblewoman and a serial killer from the family of Bathory. They owned land in the Kingdom of Hungary, which is now Hungary, Slovakia and Romania. Bathory has been labelled by the Guinness World Records as the most prolific female murderer. However, the number of her victims 
is debated. Bathory and four collaborators were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of girls and women between 1590 and 1610. The highest number of victims cited during Bathory's trial was 650, but this isn't definitely proven. Yeah, I know, a lot, right? I didn't realise that was that many. Yeah, it isn't definitely proven because you don't have, like, a lot of evidence from that Mm. time in history, which sucks, but that was a number that came up through the court trials by a witness. Mm. As a child, Bathory suffered multiple seizures that may have been caused by epilepsy, possibly stemming from the inbreeding of her parents, which was quite common with royal families back then. At the time, symptoms relating to epilepsy were diagnosed as falling sickness, and treatments included rubbing blood of a non-sufferer on the lips of an epileptic, or giving the epileptic a mix of non-sufferer's blood and a piece of skull as their episode ended. <laughs> I know, it's pretty, pretty... <laughs> Like, ancient medical history is so fascinating in itself. It is. It's so weird. This had led to speculation that Bathory's killings during her later life were part of her efforts to cure the illness she had been suffering since childhood. However, again, there is no hard evidence to support this speculation. But, I mean, that's pretty horrible as a child to suffer from that. According to the testimonies, Bathory's first victims were girls aged 10 to 14 years. The atrocities described most consistently included severe beatings. Some of Bathory's victims were covered in honey and left outside for insects to devour. During colder parts of the year, young women might be stripped naked and forced into deadly ice baths. Bathory sometimes tortured girls by driving needles into their fingers cutting their noses or lips, or whipping them with stinging nettles. Okay, first of all, you, I said, oh, you said, oh, I wish it was as good as they used to be. Oh, and I was like, Madame Lala is so scary. And you said, nah, this one's not as bad as this. She is so much worse than Madame Lala Okay, so to our listeners, if you ever... Again, if you listen to our first season, I did one on Madame LaLaurie, um, and she was so much worse, I reckon, than Elizabeth Bathory. It is pretty horrific what they're both doing, I might mm-hmm. say, but I think it's because it, it was really hard to find a lot of evidence specific mm-hmm. to what she had done because it's so far back in history, and she was like a noble woman so to keep that sort of evidence you would just very easily lose it or misplace it but yeah we're we're in a little debate over that I know continue (laughs) continue um but just back to stinging nettles I've walked past the stinging nettles bush and have it like rub against your leg Mm. that hurts could you imagine being whipped by that no it would be horrible I know So back to it, she would sometimes bite the shoulders and breasts as well as burning the flesh, including the genitals of some of her victims. Bathory was also suspected of cannibalism. Depictions of Bathory often mention her bathing in the blood of virgin victims. This is where I feel most people know about her, which Mm -hmm. um, it's the most well-known. However, this depraved action isn't backed up by witness accounts, which otherwise... Most of her accounts didn't shy away from Gore, but this one, there was no one who was able to back it up. The first mention of Bathory's blood bath actually came 100 years after her death, and that's why it's it's perceived as an invention. But they, they created the folklore that she would do it in a, an attempt to capture her youth again. But yes, um, there is no evidence that she did that while she was alive. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> I can't wait for your next one. The ne- yes, I know. But the stories, this is where it gets pretty interesting, I actually find, with her her stories. Mm-hmm. Um, well, her story, I should say. So Bathory's stories of the sadistic serial murders are verified by the testimony of more than 300 witnesses and survivors, as well as physical evidence and the presence of horribly mutilated dead dying and imprisoned girls that were found at the time of her arrest. Stories describing Bathory's vampiric tendencies, such as the tale that she had bathed in blood um, of the virgins to retain her youth, were generally recorded years after the death and are considered unreliable. Her story quickly become part of national folklore and her infamy persists to this day. So 
you know the story of Dracula as well. So um, it's believed that Elizabeth Bathory sometimes um, that she kind of uh, she inspired the story of Dracula, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. Despite the evidence against Bathory, her family's importance protected her from a death sentence. Having an influential family which ruled Transylvania be execu executed would be disgraced. She was imprisoned in December 1610 within the castle of Sate in Upper Hungary, now Slovakia. Rumours say this is the, the, the part that I always knew about her. So rumours say she was bricked and sealed in a room for the rest of her days, but other accounts do advise that she could be freely. So I remember reading when I was a kid about Elizabeth Bathory and it would say that she, the entire wall would be bricked with just the tiniest hole for food to be oh. put in. Yeah, so again, there's no hard evidence to say, but it was a pretty cool story when you are a kid to hear that. Yeah. She died at the age of 54 and three of her servants were sentenced to death immediately after captured and being tortured. Wow. Yeah. So she, she lived out the rest of her days imprisoned in her castle. That's the story of Elizabeth Bathory. It's really hard to find a lot of evidence around what she did, but there were quite a lot of witnesses to be able to testify and evidence to show, like, the physical torture she did, but mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting. Yes, absolutely. So do, is, did this live up to your hype when you asked me to do this one? <laughs> yes, it did, because I fell down the hole. I was, like, watching something, and I was like, she's messed up. She's messed up. And I just thought, I'd never heard of her, so why not tell her story, and especially during this time of Halloween? I know. I love Halloween. It's so mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I wish no. we got to do stuff like American sometimes. Oh, me too. I honestly think Halloween would be my favourite time of the year. It kind of yeah. is secretly, but <laughs> we don't celebrate it here, sadly. But yeah, that's the story of Elizabeth Bathory, said to believe to be one of the, the world known as the Vampire Queen and to inspire the story of Count Dracula. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Do you watch? No, you don't watch Wentworth, do you? Oh my god! No, I've I been seeing say? the ad actually. Ooh. The cop, like the ad where the like ex cop runs to the other cop in the prison. Whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. This this is the last season, and every episode has literally left me going, "What? What? what? Oh my god!" And ugh, I just, Harry, can you just watch it? Just I have so episode. much I need to watch. I struggle to get through all my episode choices. Um, no, I honestly don't think since the last time we have, since the last episode that I've really watched much, I have honestly been watching a lot of YouTube and just listening to a lot of podcasts. Um, my studies will be starting up again soon, so I've just been really trying to enjoy lounging around and not having to be, like, working from home to then have to jump straight to my laptop and do study. So I've just been trying to enjoy that little break. Yeah, nothing new really with me at all. I have been baking as well. Oh, my God, I made the most amazing cherry pie. Oh, my God. <sighs> <gasps> what? What? Oh, my God, like it was the most delicious cherry pie. I made it with, like, fresh pastry I made from scratch, and there was two different types of pastry, so one on the bottom and then the lattice one. Oh, so I'm putting on a few kilos. Oh, dude, you and me both. I have been trying to, um, I guess, you know, mental health well-being in lockdown mm. um, for the rest of the world. If you're listening, you know, Sydney is in lockdown again and we'll probably be in lockdown until we can get to 70% vaccination. I have also been eating a lot and I've just been trying to get myself active again because I know that, you know, even just a little bit of active activity sort of helps mental well-being sunshine just getting sunshine as well I make oh. sure that I get out every day and sometimes it's really nice to sit on the balcony and get your book out and yeah you've got a nice out. balcony that's covered though mine I just get too like it's just mm. too exposed no I the, the hotter it gets the more I prefer to do home workouts and not sort of go out so I've been doing that a little bit but I do want to try and get out and do a few more walks just because I'm coming to the end of my book I think I've only got three hours left 
The Hogfather has some, some quite long chapters if you're listening to the audio. I think to get through a full chapter is nearly an hour. So when I was doing my hour walks, I was listening to it. So I've got a little bit to go and I, I it's something that I can't listen to while I'm working on. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not very good at, at that. If I, if I need to focus on work, I'll just put music on. So, um, yeah, I, I want to do that. And I've, I've downloaded, um, yeah, so apart from listening to my book uh, and just watching YouTube, nothing new with me. Sorry, Steph has got all the answers this, this fortnight. I do. What's so. next episode's horror choice? So sorry to everyone who was listening to all our past episodes. We were going to do the Candyman, but unfortunately we're a little delayed in Australia just because we're all in lockdown and we can't go and see it at the cinema. So I've actually changed and we're going to do Village of the Damned 1960 versus the 1995 remake. I'm very excited because this is a film that I know of and I do remember seeing bits and pieces of the Kirstie Alley one in the remake, but I don't actually fully know. So I feel like I'm going to get to experience this horror movie. Without I'm, properly knowing it. I'm gen I only found out that we're doing this episode today <laughs> and I am genuinely scared because I don't like children. So, Kids are freaky in her films. Oh. If you like us, you can follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and we'd love to hear from you if you want to email us at notizons at outlook.com. We do also have merch by the amazing Craftcaster, so you can um, follow them on Facebook or Instagram, and you can also find our merch on Teespring if you Google Craftcaster. Until then, stay nerdy!